Thank you very much. I'm here traveling with my wife. We're celebrating our 35th wedding anniversary. We were... <laughs> <laughs> We were married in 1978, right out of college. We were young and naive, obviously, and uh, unashamedly idealistic. And for the first seven years of our marriage, we lived in a utopian environmentalist community in the United States. Uh, we lived in a very small space, less than 80 square meters. Well, we didn't own a car, we didn't have a lawn, we didn't have a washing machine. We did almost all our shopping on foot, and when we needed to travel someplace that we couldn't walk to, we took public transportation. Uh, we owned very few large appliances, really just a refrigerator and a stove, and our electric bill was uh, well under a euro a day. Uh, that utopian environmentalist community was New York City. Uh, we lived in Manhattan on the Upper East Side. The, to most people, even most uh, American environmentalists anyway, New York City looks like an environmental disaster. It's all concrete and diesel fumes and traffic jams and garbage. But actually, by the most significant measures, New York City is the greenest city in the United States and one of the greenest cities in the world. Uh, New Yorkers have the lowest per capita energy consumption of any Americans. New York City has a higher population than all but 11 of the 50 American states, uh, but if it, you made it a state, which you could, uh, it would rank 51st, last, in per capita energy use. Uh, per capita water consumption also very low. Same with uh, solid waste production, although the absolute number for 8.5 million people is very large, the per capita number is very small. New York City Residents are the only significant transit users in the United States. New York City contains half of all the subway stops in America. Uh, the metropolitan New York City area, New York and its suburbs, can uh, account for almost a third of all the public transit passenger miles traveled every year in the United States. Uh, the, New York City also has, and this is really the most important statistic probably, New York City has the lowest rate of automobile ownership. Uh, in the United States as a whole, we have more registered automobiles than we have licensed drivers. Uh, we have more cars than people to drive around in them. Uh, in New York City, by contrast, 54% uh, of New York City households don't own even one automobile. 77% uh, of Manhattan households don't own one. Uh, by contrast, in the state of South Dakota, 16% of households have five automobiles or more. <laughs> That's sort of an amazing statistic. The secret, uh, the secret explanation for all of this is density. When you move people and their daily destinations closer together, lots of good things happen. Their living spaces shrink. Uh, they become able to be, uh, be transit users because transit only works if you can get where you're going in a reasonable amount of time. And it only makes sense from an environmental point of view if you're not the only person on the train or the trolley or the bus. Uh, there are many cities, a, a city in the United States, Portland, that has a, uh, Portland, Oregon, which has a reputation as the greenest city in the United States. It has a beautiful light rail system in the city. And you watch the uh, rail cars go by with one or two people and maybe with a bicycle on the front. Uh, Portland is still very much an automobile-dependent city, and the reason is uh, people drive because they can, which is the, uh, in New York, you can't. Uh, New York City is one of the only places in the United States where walking is a primary form of transportation, where it's the main way people get around. Uh, it, when my wife and I, uh, we had a child, uh, when she got to be the age of one, we moved out of New York City, about 100 miles north, into the country, the move felt very green. We live across a dirt road from a nature preserve. But actually, our move was an environmental crisis, uh, we, uh, an environmental disaster. We went from owning no cars to owning one. Uh, uh, then we realized that if you have only one car, you have no way to go pick up your car when it's being serviced by the mechanic. Uh, and we got a second. Uh, and then, uh, as a result of a mild midlife crisis on my part, we ended up with a third, uh, which, then became a, which then became a necessity when our children got to be old enough to drive, 
and, and we only uh, just recently got rid of. When people imagine moving to the country, uh, they picture themselves uh, walking, taking long hikes and kayaking and gathering eggs from their own chickens. But what you really do when you move to the country is move into a car uh, because there is absolutely no other way to get around. Uh, in, in, in New York City, by contrast, and anybody he, who's here who has visited New York uh, has seen this, you can, uh, has had the experience of being in a taxi cab in a uh, traffic jam on Fifth Avenue and watching a little old lady on the sidewalk overtake you and disappear over the horizon, uh, making uh, vastly better, better time than you are. The humor website, the, the Onion, moved to New York City from the Midwest and one of the consequences of their move is they found it was very difficult to find people to be models for their photographs because New Yorkers walk so much that they aren't as fat as the average American and they didn't look like average Americans. They've since, the Onion has since moved back to the Midwest. Unfortunately, it's difficult to follow uh, the example. And with, uh, apologies to everybody else who's going to speak here. Most of the best ideas in urban planning over the history of the human race have been uh, accidents. Uh, this isn't true just of, of, uh, of urban planning, it's true of human beings in general. We tend to uh, do better by uh, accident than we do on purpose. Uh, the <laughs> New York City's, uh, the many environmental advantages that I claim for New York City are not the result of any consci uh, green consciousness on the part of New Yorkers. They're the result of a succession of historical accidents, the most important of which is uh, geographical. New York City arose on a small island rather than in the middle of nowhere. It's like a typical uh, seaport turned inside out. It's a, it's, a, it's a harbor city with a harbor around it rather than at its edge. And that barrier, coupled with certain what we would probably consider personality defects of the original settlers, caused them to build build their environment very compactly and to build it up rather than out. Uh, in fact, the, the, the cities globally that have the lowest levels of per capita energy use uh, are similar. Hong Kong and Singapore, two of the sort of uh, great examples of, of low impact living are both on islands, not accidentally. In the United States, uh, cities that uh, come closest, uh, Boston and San Francisco, are both on almost on islands. They're on peninsulas, uh, the downtown parts of them. The, the two other places where transit works pretty well. I, by contrast, grew up in the middle of the country in Kansas City, which is the, it, the, where the growth has been outward. There's really nothing uh, for 600 miles in any direction. Uh, you have to go 600 miles west till you hit the Rocky Mountains, or 600 miles to the north, you hit Lake Michigan before there's really anything in the way. Uh, as a result, Kansas City has sprawled. It's almost like pouring water onto the kitchen floor. It's just spread across the center of the country. And as a consequence, uh, the Sierra Club chose Kansas City as the place in America with the largest number of road miles per capita of any place in the country. It's a city where uh, transit simply can't work. Everybody's too far apart. There are, unfortunately, uh, as always, there are downsides to urban density, well known. Uh, so some of the ones that my wife and I experienced, it's hard to raise a one-year-old uh, in a city, easy to raise a newborn. We walked home from the hospital, hard to uh, raise a one-year-old. Once a child begins to walk, it becomes difficult. It's also true that density makes disasters more efficient, too. Uh, we saw it recently with Hurricane Sandy, which was, had a devastating impact on New York. Uh, the, uh, the largest earthquake in the history of the United States occurred in the early 1800s in New Madrid, uh, Missouri. Uh, it was so strong that it could be felt on the East Coast, almost 1,500 miles away. It actually changed the direction of the Mississippi River and moved the river over. There's now a lake uh, near New Madrid that is an old section of the Mississippi River that was cut off from it by this extraordinary earthquake. Uh, that, I don't know, on the Richter scale, it was like a 10. It was beyond uh, what we've experienced. But only a few people died because it was in an area of, of virtually no population. The same earthquake in uh, San Francisco or Los, Los Angeles today uh, would be a, a human disaster beyond our ability to even imagine it. 
Similarly with New York, like many big cities, it's uh, at sea level. Uh, even small rises in, uh, in, in the level of, of the oceans uh, cause a big problem for New York. New York City's sewer system malfunctions right now in rainstorms, uh, a five-inch rise in, in sea levels would shut it down almost entirely. Nevertheless, uh, cities in a, in a globe, uh, in a world where human population is expected to increase by perhaps 50% by the middle of the century, cities offer one of the few uh, conceivable s solutions. I talked to an urban planner who, who it was working in China and thinks of this explicitly. His a unit of measurement that he uses is the Manhattan. He was working on a large urban project in a Chinese city that virtually didn't exist 20 years ago, and he was, they were positioning eight Manhattans around inside the, inside the city. Uh, as a result, bec because of this, and because of the, di the difficulties of living in cities, I think the true environmental issues for cities and for people who think about urban planning tend not to be the things that we hear about most often, the technological uh, wonders that we hear about. It's not growing crops on the roof of your building. It's not uh, solar panels on the, uh, on the roof of your building. Solar panels, which aren't really very well suited to cities anyway, you need, you need horizontal space to make a significant solar field, a uh, little few panels here and there don't make much difference. Similarly, with, uh, with wind turbines, cities not necessarily the best place to do those. The real urban issues, the real environmental issues in cities are things, are quality of life issues. They're things like schools, quality of the schools, crime, noise, opportunities for recreation. All the factors that make people willing, once they hit the age of 25 or so, uh, to stay in living like a university student rather than branching out and living the way my wife and I have for the past uh, 25 years with uh, a garage that we can't even fit our cars in anymore because we have so much stuff in it. Unfortunately, uh, it's easy to look busy on all these environmental issues and very hard to have actual results. And we tend to focus, when we do think about the environment, on, uh, on issues that are actually really just different ways of, of enhancing our own consumption. We tend to think in terms of product substitution rather than uh, any sort of dramatic change in the way we actually organize ourselves. Uh, what car should I drive? When I redo my kitchen, what should I make the counters out of? Maybe recycled glass. All these are really just shifting uh, the problem around. I think I may be the only uh, uh, serious advocate of traffic congestion as an environmental solution. Uh, when most people look at cities, they think they look at the traffic congestion, they look at traffic jams, they say, this is terrible, all the cars go, those cars going nowhere, spewing out exhaust, but actually there's an upside to traffic congestion, which is that little old lady passing you on the, on the Fifth Avenue if cars are impossible to drive, if it is unpleasant to drive a car, you don't do it. You find another way. And the way you make it unpleasant is you make it expensive. You make your car, you don't make your car the most comfortable uh, piece of furniture that you own. Uh, you don't have the best sound system you own in your car. You don't have electronic toll paying. You make it a problem. The, I have created the world's shortest PowerPoint presentation. It has just two slides. And <laughs> I gave, I've, given it, I've given it a few times, uh, and then I realized I really don't even need the slides. So it's now an even shorter PowerPoint presentation. It doesn't have any slides. Uh, and I realized that when I gave it, I didn't even need the laser pointer. But I, I decided to keep it because laser pointers are really cool. So, uh, <laughs> and they don't use all that much energy. I have two slides. The first one is right here. This was uh, created by the city of Tampa, Florida. It was uh, looking into the idea of uh, creating a local regional transit system. And they, to demonstrate the need for it, they created a traffic jam. In this photograph is a picture of a typical traffic jam. You see it's four lanes wide. It's cars all the way from top to bottom. They're stacked up. It was a, uh, it was, they created it. It's, it's posed, but it's, you'd recognize it anywhere. It's like any street in Berlin. It's wall-to-wall -wall cars, here to here, all the way across. 
in the second slide I'm going to show you takes all the passengers out of all these cars and places them on chairs in the middle of the same street. And when I show you the second slide, everybody gasps because when people see the picture, they always gasp. In the second slide, the second slide is just as big, but the people in the chairs are just like right here. All the people from these cars over here fit into this tiny, tiny space. You could fit it almost into this circle on the stage, and you could easily fit it into the back half of any light rail car passing through Berlin right now. The lesson that people usually take from this is, ah, we should build transit systems because look, we shrink down all this traffic jam into this tiny, tiny thing. But, like everything that's more complicated than it looks, if you're one of the drivers in all these cars over here, and you look at this slide over here, you see this tiny group of people and all these empty traffic lanes that used to be full of cars, and you think, my problem has been solved, now I can drive to work in 10 minutes instead of the hour it takes me now because all those other cars are out of my way. And this is the second step in uh, transit schemes, transportation schemes, which is you not only have to move all these people into transit, you have to keep them there and you have to keep all these other people who are coming from looking at that empty road space and getting cars of their own. That's much more difficult to do. It's very easy to, it's relatively easy to spend billions of dollars on transit systems. It's hard to talk people into taking traffic lanes away from drivers, giving them to bicyclists, digging them up, getting rid of them entirely, uh, much harder to do. I'm very glad that I came uh, to Germany because when I was here, I, to, I saw something that I've been looking for, which is the greenest car uh, in the world. And Germany is not surprising, I guess, the place to find it with its, his, its tremendous reputation for automotive uh, excellence. But the car is not manufactured by uh, Mercedes or, uh, or Volkswagen or Porsche or BMW. Uh, I saw it uh, yesterday in a museum and then also yesterday on the street. The one I saw in the museum was at the DDR Museum, the East German Museum. It's the Trabant. And the, the Trabant is a green car, despite its, uh, the terrible stuff that came out of the exhaust pipe, uh, for the same reasons that electric cars are green, which is it, they don't work very well as cars. You can't go very far in it. For a Trabant, you had to wait 10 years to get it. Uh, you had to spend a very large pr proportion of your income uh, to buy it. Uh, you didn't drive it very much because it, it just didn't work very well. It took you 20 seconds to get to 60 miles an hour. Uh, it didn't work very well in the cold, and a lot of times you had to push it. If all our cars were like that today, as, if all our cars were as green as the Trabant, we wouldn't uh, let ourselves live 100 miles away from where we work. We wouldn't live in suburbs and drive into the city. We wouldn't do what Americans often do, which is get in the car and drive all the way across the country without, getting it, without stopping except to go to the bathroom and, and get something to eat and refill the tank. Uh, we would live uh, like green urbanites of the future, uh, mostly on foot and with public transit and with a much smaller impact than we have now. I have 35 seconds left, and I'm going to give it to someone else. <laughs> Thank you.